morning, everybody. It's great to be here. It's very weird to be here after a couple years um, predominantly seeing people on a virtual Zoom screen, um, but it's really nice and wonderful to be back with, with uh, you all in person here. Um, I'm delighted that I saw some of you last week. We had a press preview and um, various previews at the Whitney Museum for the biennial um, 2022, Quiet As It's Kept, and I Hold on. <laughs> I can also see yeah. the next slide. Cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a Pavarotti La Boheme box here, and apparently the clicker was underneath it. So thank you for rescuing the clicker. Um, anyway, I hope that if you haven't already been to the Biennial, you'll ha make time to, uh, to visit. And I've been watching a lot of basketball lately, for those of you who like March Madness. So I'll just say that it really is, um, takes a lot of people, a team, to get the ball down the court. And similarly, in a museum, um, obviously, the, you know, the, it takes the entire staff to support the vision of the curators and the artists, and that exhibition in particular, the scale of it. Um, so, you know, very inspiring to, to work on that show. Um, in any event, let me see where we're going next. I wrote a million notes down. I was very enthusiastic preparing for this talk, and it could go in a lot of uh, directions. Um, before I go in all of those directions, let me just echo um, the words that we heard a little bit before, um, thanking the Talking Galleries team for putting on such a great um, event. Uh, Lucia and Saul have been terrific to work with, and of course, Alan for hosting us, Alan Schwartzman, and Loring, who I agree just seems like grace under pressure and manages to pull off amazing things. So thank you for your kind words, and I do remember, and I loved when I visited galleries, if someone would stand up and actually come talk to me. So um, that, that was actually my pleasure to, to speak to people when I, when I would make the rounds, and I miss those days a lot. Uh, so Talking Galleries gave me, oh my god, I'm up on the screen already, a couple of prompts um, for the talk, which were um, how did we get here and where are we today? Those are very broad prompts, um, offering up all kinds of possibilities to answer those questions. Um, and I decided really um, to take this opportunity to uh, go back and look through what, you know, what, what, I, what I felt comfortable and equipped to speak about. And I was an art journalist, a writer, an author for many years. And I've never really talked about my own personal experiences, um, partly because one of the first lessons of journalism school is report the news, don't be the news. So, you know, I would never kind of put a picture of myself up on the screen. These things have never been seen by anybody, not even my family. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing putting this up, but I just thought we're in a moment of reflection. It's been an intense couple of years, as Alan, you referred to, the multitude of things going on and just even waking up this morning and seeing the headlines about the Ukraine. It's all so disturbing and heightened and emotional. I just, you know, life is very different now. Um, and in fact, I have some interesting behind the scenes stories to tell about covering the art world and with some of my colleagues who I see out in, in the audience. Um, and I don't think, you know, art journalists often kind of talk about their process or maybe they do when I haven't noticed, but I, anyway, this is sort of where I came to in, in thinking about my talk um, today. So I'm gonna show some pictures. They're all kind of snapshots. The quality stinks. I apologize to all the artists who happen to be in one of the photos because they're not up to my, my quality control in terms of the quality of the images that I, I'm going to be sharing. Um, so just a few things to before I dive into sort of the anecdotes and the stories and the behind the scenes, um, I did want to, you know, take the question a little bit seriously about putting aside how did we get here, where are we? Um, and again, it's a, it's, a, it's a question that almost feels unanswerable in, in this very um, destabilized time. But there's a few things that I've noticed, and I'm sure you all have too, obvious, they need to be talked about. Um, number one is this rapid shift to digitization that has happened in the past few years. Um, and I felt like the art world has always been fairly Luddite and a little slow to adapt. Um, but we've all had to quickly, um, you know, make progress, particularly where institutions, organizations closed and everything had to shift online. And in fact, in 2021, it looks like Talking Galleries was online. So, you know, this obviously was highly pervasive. And not only did people shift their events to being online, but obviously even, even less visible um, um, institutional um, operations whereby you use QR codes and ticketing and all of these things that did in fact create maybe more efficiencies for, for organizations 
And then, of course, because I'm a, a journalist mind, I'm always worried about the consequences of having less human interaction and also, um, you know, hum will humans ultimately not be needed? And now when I'm in New York City, in and out of the city, um, and I'm more observant of what's going on in the city, and I see, you know, people not coming in to pick up their burger, um, ordering their burger, and, you know, there just doesn't seem like there's as much human interaction as the New York that I, I've, I've lived in for 30 years, and I, 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 I lament that a bit. Um, so there's this digitization, number one. Um, Alan obviously alluded to the second major point, which is this urgent need for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, across, obviously, not just the art world, but beyond, um, and particularly in the wake of the galvanizing uh, Black Lives Matters protests in 2020. And this is interconnected with conversations happening around pay, compensation, uh, conversations that are happening within the art world and you know, at Amazon, on Staten Island, everywhere, these conversations are happening. Uh, this is also connected, kind of zooming out even further, with power shifts, which, um, Alan, you already talked about this a little bit with your um, mentioning of your podcast, which I've been listening to. I really recommend you di dive into Hope and Dread, Alan's project with Charlotte Burns. And it's a really interesting conversation over many um, episodes about these power shifts and the kind of rise of agency of artists, for example, and the rise of agency of cultural staffs or even audiences. Um, and there are big, big changes happening and that have been happening slowly, and I, I recommend that. And also, Farah Nairi, who will be um, host, uh, moderating a panel later on um, art, um, they call The Invisible Market. She has a new book, which I just got, um, called Take Down Art and Power in the Digital Age. So these ideas are obviously in the air, and um, lots more to say there. Um, so getting back to where are we today, um, and I have to kind of question the question, you know, of validity or the ability to answer that question. Um, so, you know, again, just to per per speak personally for a moment, um, you know, this, this last couple of years, unforeseen, this pandemic, um, you know, tremendous change personally in my life, I'm sure for a lot of people as well, reprioritization, fear, anxiety, um, and, you know, it, th there's a lot going on, but also some silver linings. Um, and in order to, to answer the question, you know, I, I thought it would be helpful to talk to some people about where we are today. And I kind of dusted off my old reporter's notebook from my days as a journalist and um, called up some folks and asked them where, where we are. And, you know, people do tend to immediately jump into kind of the art market when you ask them what's happening. And so an art dealer re reported to me that, you know, in December at Art Basel, their gallery had had the best sales ever and six and seven figure sales and also noting at the same time how discouraging she was that uh, buyers were interested in such a short group of, uh, you know, a, a concentrated list of artists. And of course, I've, I'd been hearing that, you know, for, for a decade or more since reporting on the art market, but it seems like it's only gotten maybe more exacerbated with people um, looking at art on social media, which I, of course, do, and, and JPEGs. Um, an art advisor friend said the same thing, that we're so busy, turning away business, hiring more staff, and, you know, what, again, what I'd seen at least over a decade ago and more, you know, the top, I don't know, 1%, 5% uh, wealthiest people are insulated even during this pandemic, and um, the top end of the art market goes on, but then, of course, there's the other 95%. Um, and I called a friend who was a, you know, a, a painter, a kind of middle-aged, mid-career painter, who told me she'd been struggling to pay bills during the pandemic. So again, there's always, if you try to assess the art market per se, so many different stories, depending on who you speak to, at what level, at what perspective, where. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a fool's errand in some regard, but um, uh, in any case, what I thought I would, um, share now is to talk a little bit about, you know, I was reporting uh, particularly on the art market from around 2003 to 2011 when I went into, um, went to work on the editorial side of Art in America magazine, which really, and then, and then the Whitney, which really took me away from kind of the art and business context. But so going back to 2008, um, as we are here, and this is a picture of um, after the auctions at Sotheby's York Avenue, just painting the, the scene, it was a kind of a big night. I think it was impressionist and modern. Um, you know, there was this Francis Bacon painting that was estimated at lots and lots of money. 
and it sold for lots and lots of money. I think it sold for $86 million. Um, and, you know, those numbers were kind of so astronomical and so hard to fathom, but, uh, you know, the auctions were in fact great fodder for reporters, and the reason that auctions, and also I would say lawsuits, are great fodder in the art world for coverage is well, you can get facts. And I know, again, this um, question about transparency and opacity, well, auctions they actually produce a, you know, ostensibly a price list, and I say ostensibly a little tongue-in-cheek because you don't really know the mechanics of what's going on at the auction houses, but you do get a sense of something to report if you are trying to report something. So the auctions for, for my, were my, one of my main beats and um, ability to, and at this time I should note, you know, some of us will remember walking around trying to get art dealers to give out prices at art fairs and places or in galleries, and it was not always easy, Loring, to get people to tell prices, and I don't know if it has changed and is easier today, but it was, it was really difficult, so it was hard to come up with a good story. Um, anyway, this tactic of having a really expensive painting that was a big number, you know, really worked for the auction houses, this playbook, I think they're still doing it, I just saw a $200 million Warhol is coming up for sale, you know, that's, it's very successful, again, I don't know the economics, I don't know if these sales are profitable, I don't know who, you know, any of the mechanics, but it's, it's a good kind of stunt, um, and it works. So um, just to also step back and just for a moment explain sort of how the art auction coverage came together, at least then. Um, so if you were a journalist, you would be given um, access to the sales room, and at Sotheby's in New York, you stood at the front of the room, like I am looking at all of you. If you were at Christie's, you stood in the back of the room, so you could really just see the backs of people's heads, which was extremely annoying, and if you were at Phillips, I think we were maybe on the side, and everyone was kind of huddled together like this, and I mean, I always thought of it like a pen, and you had to stand there for a couple of hours, um, and you know, so and it wasn't like the most comfortable thing on the planet, um, and watching, you know, all the action, or trying to watch all the action, um, and you'd be scanning up, there's like these sky boxes, is that, you know, Steve Cohen, is that, you know, Steve Wynn, you know, who's drinking champagne, you couldn't really tell what was going on, there's curtains, it was all very, you know, dramatic in a way, um, and of course, um, you know, the same reporters came to all of these, uh, cover all these events, so you kind of got to know everybody. There was Eileen Kinsella from Art News, and Josh Baer from The Bear Facts, and Walter Robinson for Artnet. Sarah Douglas was writing for, um, I think, Art, um, Art and Auction, and Sarah Thornton would pop in, who was working on her book, and, you know, it was kind of like a little group. Carol Vogel, who wrote for the New York Times, was, of course, there. She was always very well-sourced and knew who was buying and selling, and she um, was uh, also the only reporter who was, um, had a, seemed to have a chair reserved <laughs> at all the auctions to everybody else's, <laughs> you know, notice, and uh, she didn't actually get to sit in her folding chair because uh, she had to see what was happening, but um, it was a good place for her to put her sweater. Um, and I had three things working in my favor, however. Um, I had worked at Sotheby's uh, for a few years after college, so I had a sense how the auction business worked. Um, I was also quite tall, so I could see what was going on, which was actually super important. And lastly, um, I could recognize faces in the crowd, which sounds kind of ridiculous, um, but it was really the key to success as an auction reporter. Um, and years later, I saw a 60-minute episode that talked about um, super recognizers, and there was this test they had online. And it turns out I am a super recognizer. And um, it's really good for police work and Scotland Yard, but it's also good if you um, wish to become an auction reporter, I will say, because I can recognize someone from behind and looking at their earlobes sometimes. Um, so after these sales, after the auction, you know, we, we all stand there till like 9.30 or 10, and then, by the way, we have to get to work and write it up. And all the dealers and everybody would head off to dinner, and we would be there. Um, and for those of us who needed to file, like, immediately, because this was when things were shifting online, you know, you couldn't file your article to run, like, next month in Art and Auction magazine. People wanted to read about it, like, now or tomorrow. Um, so a number of us brought laptops to the sale, and we'd set up shop, and that's why I'm still there at 11 o'clock at night, like, typing away. Um, we had Kelly Crow from the Wall Street Journal, often working near us, Chris Mouchot from Reuters, and then for Bloomberg, there was, I was working for Bloomberg News, uh, there was me, and I had a partner, Philip Boroff, because we really needed the two of us, frankly, <laughs> to get the stuff out quickly. 
Um, and you know, this was just a moment when I think art coverage and reporting was again shifting. We had to try to file as fast as possible. You know, we didn't have to write about every lot. We just had to kind of write about the important things, important quasi news, important things. Um, and we had to try to jam as much as we could in the first paragraph because there was an un increasing understanding that people might only read the first paragraph. So you really had to pack it in the news. And then we started doing multiple takes. We'd file one paragraph during the sale, like if this painting sold for you know, a lot of money. Or we'd even just put a headline out. So it became increasingly fast and, and more truncated. Um, and this was really a reflection of where you know, media seem to be heading, and I think we obviously now, 10 years later, understand that, um, you know, print is no longer the dominant medium for news, and this was really the way things, in fact, were, were heading. Um, okay, let me see if I can actually use this clicker. Okay, yes, so we're going to switch scene. We are now in Abu Dhabi. It is just a year later, about 2009, and you might recognize Alexandra Pierce. She was an editor, is an editor, she's a writer, editor. She worked for many years at the Wall Street Journal, and this is my kind of section on um, uh, uh, press trips, because they're a really important part of the press, press world, and um, interesting, emblematic kind of part of the art world. So uh, in 2009, the uh, Tourism Development and Investment Corporation from Abu Dhabi invited journalists to come visit. And like here, there was a symposium, but there also was an art fair, and there was an early look at a development site where there were aspirations to build three very substantial museums. Um, and first off, just to say, for those of you who don't know, um, a press trip is when someone invites a journalist to come, usually at, not at the journalist's expense, you usually get flown and you get accommodations, et cetera, and there's oftentimes an expectation that you will cover, write about, produce something uh, in exchange. And of course, you know, if we take our ethics hat on, you know, it is awkward to write um, objectively about um, something where you are, your host is who paying for the ride. Um, and you know, certain publications do not permit press trips, but the flip side, of course, is that at this time, uh, curators you know, were traveling, the art world was more and more global, curators, collectors rather, were traveling, dealers were traveling, and for the press not to travel, I think we all felt that wasn't gonna give us a good understanding of, of what was going on. So, you know, people, it was a kind of a balance. Anyway, this was quite the press trip, I will say, and I'd never been to the Middle East. Um, it was a big, it's a big perk for journalists. We're paid, you know, really modestly, I will say, uh, for the work, so you could never afford to, to get this kind of access and these kind of trips. So here's Alexandra by the, um, by the beach in Abu Dhabi, and let's see, I remember showing up at the New York airport, I remember this lounge full of art world folks, um, I remember getting on the airplane, I think I remember being spritzed by rose water, I had a big comfortable seat, I thought it was amazing, I got off the plane and I saw a dealer friend and she said, my cabin had beds and shower, and I thought, oh my goodness. So, you know, you knew you were heading into like a different level of wealth or, or something um, when you arrived there. Um, here I am actually at the Abu Dhabi Art Fair, which I think was the first or second year it happened, and they really got substantial dealers there. Uh, in part because they were, of course, planning to open multiple museums, so I'm, I'm sure dealers were smart, and they figured new museums can make some sales. So, you know, I guess you can probably figure out which stand I'm standing beside. Um, there was Jeff Koons, and I believe, actually, I think this was Gagosian. It was held in the Emirates Palace, um, and you can see it's not very crowded. You know, this was a very nascent market. There weren't like a lot of people and attending the fair um, for the most part, although at some point, you know, there were, there were people who came, visitors who came. So, you know, they were trying to get people um, interested and, and look at the art. Um, and, you know, but one of the good things for journalists was that the dealers weren't super busy. And so you could kind of buttonhole them. And there is Sarah Douglas, uh, again, 10 years ago plus. Um, Max, tell her that I uh, showed this picture, will you? And uh, she's hanging out with Mark Glemsher. Uh, Pace Gallery brought some giant Calder mobiles, which were on the beach and you know in various locations. And um, so, for, again, for journalists, it's usually you can't, you don't. I, I don't even go near dealers at art fairs because they're usually quite busy, and you don't want to interfere. They're you know, making sales or whatever. This art fair, the dealers were like, "Come in, come chat. You know what's going on? What's going on? You know, it was that kind of an art fair." 
Um, here you can see another one. Here is Ivan Wirth from Hauser and Wirth. Um, you know, again, everyone was excited to see journalists, which you know isn't always the case. Um, so that was a good a good press trip from that point of view. And there were parties, and so you know, for for people like me, you get to go up and you know try to take a decent picture of some of the people that you recognize. Um, and that was that was very you know fun too for the press trip, the access that we got. Um, Let's see. Oh, yes. Okay, so then also there were these museums that were being planned, and they took us out to the island, and we got to meet with Jean Nouvel. So again, I mean, the benefit of these press trips, they really do go to great lengths to give you access. And here we got to talk to the architect about this Louvre that was planned to be built at the time, and ultimately was built, I believe, in 2017. Um, some of the other museums, I think, have, have been a little slower to be built. There have been issues around Gulf labor that have come up. I have not been invited back to Abu Dhabi. Since then, so if anybody's listening or on the live stream, um, okay, curious what happened since then. Um, but in any case, that was sort of an interesting, and again, this all happening in this 2008, 2009, I should obviously point out, for those of you who don't remember, many banks started failing, big crash. So at the time, back in the US, um, I just wanted to show this kind of as a contrast at the moment, showing how the art world can be very much of a contrast. Uh, Brandeis University, a uh, university in Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, which has a very small but strong art museum founded in the 60s, uh, announced in 2009 that they were going to close their museum and sell off everything, which was, I have 6,000 artworks reportedly, you know, appraised around $400 million to shore up their finances. And I mean, it was shocking. It was really shocking. And I have to say, when I went there and somebody put an ATM uh, poster over the door. I thought that like that says it all. That says it all. So I, I took that picture, and here are some other images of the museum. So you can really see um, kind of what 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 was at stake here, uh, and and many more things, obviously. Um, anyway, as an old-fashioned journalist, you know I often try to keep an open mind, under see both sides. But sometimes it's really hard to see both sides, and it really felt that the university had made a terrible decision, um, and you know really shows you how economics and museums and cult the cultural sector are very inter intertwined. But ultimately, there is a happy ending. And the museum was not closed. It was, thank God, saved. And it's free and open to this day. So if you are anywhere near Boston, um, you should go and just say thank you. And also just remember Michael Rush, the wonderful director who um, stood up a lot and spoke out against this and, uh, and sadly passed away in the, in the, since then, but was, was a, a wonderful human being. Um, Okay, so where do we go from there? Let's see, we're gonna go from there to, it gets a little more bananas. Okay, um, so I was gonna talk a little bit about art galleries. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm pulled out sort of my most, I would say, egregious case studies um, from this time period because, you know, I wanna set the day off and have thing, you guys remember some of the stories that I'm telling. Um, but one of the things that happened, I mentioned auctions and then, of course, lawsuits was an interesting case of a gallery called Salander O'Reilly. Um, probably that name rings a bell for a number of you. Um, and here we are in, in, again, the super eventful 2009. This is a press conference held by the Manhattan District Attorney, yep, Robert Morgenthau in the center. And they invited press and they tried to explain as they were um, indicting an art dealer, Larry Salander, on you know close to $100 million charges that he stole art. And it was a complicated thing to, um, to get across what was the nature of the things he was doing. Here's another um, image, which is Judd Tully, some of you may remember. Um, and here is a, um, an image at, uh, that the, the district attorney presented the attorney, uh, of a Stuart Davis painting that was, again, kind of owned by 350% of the people. Um, Earl Davis, the son of the artist, really sad that he was, had, you know, up to, I think, around 50 paintings basically stolen. Um, and then there were other people who, uh, whose names you may recognize, Elaine Rosenberg, um, John Landau, Gerald Peters, et cetera, who were sold um, pieces of the, the artwork. Um, and this, this story, you know, was really just kind of an, an amazing one. Um, and it, the, the story of the downfall was an amazing one too. And, and reporting on it was, was, was endlessly fascinating. And, and again, just a cautionary tale um, and somewhat related in a way, and I'll say this is kind of provocative, but about the 
unregulated nature of the art market because you know, in many businesses, you, you can't actually sell something 350% um, because there's, you know, there's just, it's difficult to do that. Um, but here he was doing that for a very long time. Um, and so I think that's kind of interesting now to think about it. And, you know, Larry Salander, who's a really in, in, interesting, complicated person, um, you know, did ultimately plead guilty and is, is in jail as far as I know um, at this point. So it's, an, it's a really interesting story. But... We can chat about it later, actually. And I put that this was in Millbrook. I, I went, he, op he worked at, even after all the allegations at a, a gallery in Millbrook, but actually these are paintings by Larry Salander. Um, and there was an auction um, as part of uh, trying to recoup the losses um, at, I think, Stair Gallery in Hudson is actually the correct caption. So forgive me for not fact-checking this until it was too late. Um, anyway, moving along quickly. So now we go to art fairs. Um, and apologies to Melanie Gurlis, who just, um, who's moderating a panel later and just came out with a book called The Art Fair Story. I think it released in the US maybe on Friday. I haven't read her book yet. I'm very excited to read it. Um, but I thought I would just show some fun images from art fairs because I, as professionally, had to attend so many of them. I mean, I have to say, you'd never think you'd get tired of going to you know, Basel, Switzerland, but you know, there was a lot of Basel visits and, um, and Miami and all the same places over and over. But you know, it was always kind of interesting and this buzzy celebrity side of, of the, the, um, the art fairs. But this was a little bit like the, um, to me, the $86 million bacon. So this gallery, um, Mergenska, um, a Swiss gallery, they you know, realized if they had a celebrity artist, uh, they would get, you know, look at all the media. And there's Sylvester Stallone. He's a little bit hidden. And so sorry again for my crummy photography. But he, he's a painter, and they were exhibiting his work. And again, you know, you'd go around the fair, and then all of a sudden you'd see, like, all oh, these people clustered. And it was typically because of something like this, which, you know, is just one dimension of, of the art fair, um, kind of the amusing most, one that attracts kind of the most mainstream press. Um, but, it you know... Uh, and then they did it again the next year. So there was um, Calvin Klein, Danny Glover, George Hamilton on the booth. And again, it was just like you kind of had to report it um, because, you know, there they were. Um, but of course, again, these things are all, I, I assume, planned out. How else would these people be appearing when all the press happened to be lurking around as well? So it was, you know, a thing. So I thought I'd give us some, let's see, oh, see, a lot of press. Okay, and that's a bratwurst. Um, so that's lunch <laughs> um, in Basel for most people who have a um, like little budget and a little time. Um, and I thought I'd put it up as a palate cleanser for a moment. Um, but you know, I was going to say these art fairs are not always about you know the hype. And I, I have to say I enjoy enjoyed going to them. Um, and you know, you, you saw a lot of art. The art was very commoditized, like it is at the auctions. But it, it's the connections with people, the things that we haven't experienced lately that were really rewarding. And um, you know, I just took a lot of pictures of people at stands. This happened to be Mark Bradford around 2010. I put this one in Freeze for, uh, for those of you who uh, you know, know about Freeze. Um, and Mary Hallman, you know, this, this fair did have a real kind of art, artsy bent that was very, you know, they each have their own, their own dynamic. Um, and then, of course, there were critics that hung around at the art fairs, too. There's Jerry Salt. So, you know, it was fun. It's, lo it's really fun bumping into people, having, ch you know, chats, getting, getting um, you know, getting the temperature, seeing what's happening. Um, and auctions and, you know, the art fairs are kind of the gallery's answer to the auction houses. You know, they are an event. It's time-bound. I'm sure you all have thought about this, and I'm sure it's been talked about in talking galleries panels years years in past, but you know, it, it even had so much um, kind of transactions, parties, people that we were able, and I worked for the art newspaper for many years on these fair editions that we would put out where we would literally have to run around a convention center and come up with stories like really fast, um, but you know, somehow we always managed to do it even if it was just like Sylvester Stallone has got a painting on booth, whatever. Um, but you, you do try to put it out and here's, um, you know, here's this paper which I, I think was, was fun to work on. I, I have fond memories of that art um, newspaper team. Um, let's see. Oh, I was going to stop. I should have stopped, but there's one more. Um, and just to say, you know, after all of this art market coverage and, you know, I could not look at a Rothko without thinking like, oh, $80 million. You know, at a certain point, it's 
a lot, so I was really fortunate to have an opportunity to uh, work on the editorial side of Art in America magazine, a long-standing magazine, um, and it was really an incredible, an incredible opportunity to work with a lot of interesting people. Um, and I'll just name a few. Um, and it was contrarian, as I like to be, going to a print magazine after working for a digital um, company like Bloomberg. But you know, people like Kathy Leibowitz, Faye Hirsch, Richard Vine, who is still there, Will Smith, uh, D Brian Drycore, Sarah Cascone, Julia Fiore, to name a s few of the editors that I worked with, as well as people like Betsy Baker. Um, and you might have seen Ted Mooney's obituary. He predates me, but he was a really important editor at the magazine for 30 years. So these publications, and not just Art in America, but you know all of them, I think, and art journalism generally is, is not particularly well funded. It's very important to the art world and the art ecosystem to tell the important stories and, um, and help foster the kind of dialogue we're having today. So I just wanted to plug that um, because I feel really important. It's really important. Thank you. Um, Okay, I think I should probably wrap it up. So what I'm just gonna say is that again, in journalism school, they teach you to end on a kicker, and a kicker quote, it's like save your best quote for last. But what I'm gonna say is we are gonna have so many great quotes today, because this programming is amazing, and I can't, I'm gonna stay here and write down all the kicker quotes. Um, and I just wanna say, have a great time um, over the next two days, and thank you. I'm very flattered to have been able to kick it off, and hope I gave everybody some, um, some fun stories to think about. Thank you.